but there are microgreens program that will will you know give you a tray and it's still live and it's still attached to the pad right now that's great and all but i feel like that's really hard to care for because you need the space and the right room spots um to do that so you're right there are a couple of microgreens guy that or, or company has come came in and gave me samples and so there are times when I get the little tray and I have to leave them out in a room temp area, right? And that's not really, it, it, it's hard. If there's more var variables, there's more chances of messing up and mistakes. So margin of errors, right? For me, that's that. If there's a, when there's a product that is cared for already and packaged properly, that makes it easier for me. It, it's, it's more approachable for, for a restaurant to use. Welcome to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving Mike Green's empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest Mike Green's farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of Mike Green's. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Junior Vo, who is the executive chef and partner of NoCo Nashville. Junior and I have a great conversation on business philosophy and reveal what the deciding factors are for a chef when purchasing microgreens. This includes things like pricing, building relationship, shelf life, convenience, building trust, and so much more. There is a ton of valuable information in this episode. If you are a microgreen grower or someone interested in selling to chefs, Let's get right into today's episode. Hey, Junior, welcome to the podcast. I'm really, really excited for, to have you on. I think this is going to be a really insightful episode for a lot of microgreens growers and just to learn about your background as well. So I'm really excited to have you on. Glad to be here. I'm very excited. I'm, I'm excited myself to talk about some of the things that, you know, I do daily. Awesome. Yeah. So I'd love to kind of maybe just start off by hearing how you first got interested in cooking and the culinary scene and then get into the kind of the backstory of how your restaurant, NoCo Nashville, came to be. Um, you know, I can spend a whole day talking about this, write a chronicle <laughs> if we want to, but I'll um, try just a short version of it. Um, so I, I, I went to, you know, a, a four-year college for something else I completely didn't even like. And throughout the years, you kind of have to make a living to support that college dream. And eventually, my first job while doing that was um, serving at a hibachi restaurant. And, you know, after a while, I kind of just enjoy the, the, the feeling of being in the restaurant because we eat family meal or we uh, hang out together or we get to eat different cuisines every day because there was like six different chefs from six different countries. Wow. And it's pretty dope so so i got to see the, the 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 food culture right in that sense in that small version of the world um and they started teaching me to cook small things and i just kind of make the story short and and and, and, and simple but i just kind of figured that i like cooking more than i like going to school um uh, and so i i yeah i finished the core programs and i just kind of just stopped and uh eventually got into more cooking became a hibachi chef started learning sushi at the same restaurant because there's a sushi hibachi kind of thing and so just 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 started from there and i just the, the love for cooking serving people learning how people eat so then you can cook for them so hibachi is like a show right but it it's a lot of times or most time it'll be you cooking your style of food for people but there are times there'll be requests like, hey, can you make mine with more of this, more of that? You know, and it's very specific to each guest. Mm. So as soon as I make them to how they want it, you know, and they, they taste it and it's like, oh, this is this is awesome. We love this. And so that right there give you a little bit of satisfaction, right? Like it makes me makes me feel good. And so I, I just I just never stopped. Um, then because of. Uh, not having any classical training, I decided to go to uh, culinary school and just to learn the back end of things like the classic, you know, um, techniques, basic techniques and um, serve saves and things like that. And then 
you know, continue to just work in different cities. I started out in Atlanta, moved, got an opportunity to move to Charleston, South Carolina, to work in a very small but big food scene. Um, and so I got to learn a lot there. Um, and then throughout time, you know, I've met my partners, current partners, about seven, eight years ago. We have worked together since in, in a company. And uh, after, you know, working together and then COVID happened, right? So we kind of made it through COVID um, as well. And so at one point we just felt um, there's a need and there's a, there's a, and you're working for and with a group, you're not really able to do everything your way in a sense, right? And yeah. We have a belief system that we believe in. Like we feel indifferent about certain things. Now, nothing was bad. We just feel indifferent about certain things. And it, it, it was getting so big that we didn't feel like we can manage it at the highest level. So we decided to um, found opportunities and decided to open our restaurant um, just so we can dial back down a little bit to kind of pay attention more to the things that, that matters m more than most people might think. Um, and so for our restaurant, the word is really, there's so many core values, but one of them is sustainability, right? And we feel sustainability in food is important. Very, very, very important, but sustainability in people, right? Mm -hmm. We know there's, um, you know, the over, um, you know, the, the turnover rates, the people quitting, the mental issues, a, a lot of things like the work ethics, the, the, the just the hostility in the kitchen. I'm, we're never gonna, well, I'm not never, but we're not gonna, we, we can't fix it ourselves, right, or change it ourselves. Um, but we have an idea on how to start doing it. So that's why we start our own company and doing our own thing and talk about sustainability. Are we sustainable to the maximum right now? I don't think anyone is, honestly. I mean, you, you win some and you lose some. I feel like it's really hard. I don't think it's possible to be perfect, perfect, right? Yeah. But you can get close and you can really try. Um, and it's a work in pro progress. It's, it's, it's a long-term goal. It's not tomorrow. It's just something we're working on. How do we, how do we have, we don't know the how, but we're going to learn along the way because every group of, of people is completely different than the next. Yeah. Um, and every person is different from the next, right? Like it's just not just a group. Um, and every restaurant, every situation, every city is different from the rest. So we're just finding the opportunities and, 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 and learn from doing that. Making mistakes, obviously. Make new mistakes, right? And learn from that, really. Um, so here we are. Uh, actually, in two weeks, it'll be a year since we've opened. Wow. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Time just flew by. Yeah. And, uh, yeah awesome. Very yeah. Congratulations. That's 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 amazing. I think you you have such a... I can already tell you have such a... Uh, the right attitude to be an entrepreneur and, and to progress in terms of, like, society as a whole. Like, the way I always view these type of things where, you know, there's a culture, like you said, in kitchens that may not be ideal. Like, I, I, I can't change that on my own. You can't change that on your own. But like by doing your part in changing that, by focusing on what you can do, it, you're, you're going to have an impact because it's going to spread. People are going to see, oh, like I want to work at a place like this. I don't want to work at th these, uh, the, whatever, the, the past generation of, of restaurant owners and, and, and their mindset. So it really does move things forward. Um, and I think, I think it has a bigger effect changing individually than people may realize because it, it has a compounding effect over the rest of your life to have that kind of mindset. And I think it's, it's really, really powerful. So I'm so, so glad to hear that you, you, you. you know, you think that way and, and you decide to start your, your own business and do it the way that as much as you can move in the right direction in terms of sustainability. And, and it's a great, great point. Like a lot of people think sustainability is like just environmental, like you know, the climate or, uh, you know, producing food that's not as sprayed and, and grown more environmentally sustainable, but there's financial sustainability, there's social sustainability, there's uh, a mental sustainability, given yeah. how difficult of a work environment working in a restaurant is. So, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an all-encompassing kind of thing, and it's not just, uh, 
it's not just financial or environmental, which is the two that I think most people really tend to, or at least from my experience, tend, tend to focus on. Yeah. Do you have, um, just side note, do you have a, a partner in your business? No, no. So I'm doing, I, I had, I had uh, my farm for 10 years that I recently yeah. sold. And then now I'm starting my newest venture, which is the education side of, of my Koreans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm not, not that you need a partner, but in, in certain situation, like a restaurant, there's always two sides to a coin, right? Yeah. Like there's the front and there's a the back, but that's not, that's not necessary. It only needs just two. So in my case, we have three, there's two other partners. So there's three of us and I couldn't ask for a better partner because we're on the same page, right? Like we might, we don't need to be on the same level, but if we're on the same page, we can get to each other's level when yeah. it comes to, to, to anything like business, taking care of people. We're going to try. We're going to, we got each other to base off of. So I think that's also another thing that's important, having partners that help you sustain um, uh, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I think uh, I often think of, of a business partnership in, in, in a way as a marriage. Uh, it's just a different type of, of marriage. Oh, yeah. Um, We're in bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bed. Yeah. So, so finding the right people. So the, the approach that I've taken is more collaboration. So um, I'm working with uh, other content creators, working with um, other other people in the industry that, you know, I, I have formed relationships in the past and kind of building products and building things with others rather than like, owning the same company. And I think it just allows like a lot more crossover by no means saying it's better than having partners or, or worse or anything like that. Loving collaboration. I'm sure you've done some, some things, uh, over the years of collaboration as well with, uh, with, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you've, you've oh, yeah, seen that. the benefits of that as well. Oh, huge. Yes. Yeah. Huge. Collaboration is, is also one of our, um, core values. We have uh, about eight core values and one, one of that is collaboration, right? So, you know, we, our menu alone right now is collabing with micro, you know, uh, Pinky's Micro. That's one. Um, we do uh, high five cookies. So they bake our brookies for desserts, right? We do a black box ice cream locally um, for ice cream. And we use a bread maker, Charpier's Bakery. And we have a bagel guy, right? So there's so many vendors and collaboration that that's, helping us becoming who we are mm -hmm. and helping on, you know, on the back end, helping them sustain their business as well. It's not a lot, but it's a little and it helps, right? Like, um, doesn't matter how much it is. I feel like it, it, it helps. No matter yeah. What. Um, because we, we took over the second generation space, which we don't have a lot of room to do a lot of things. So we can't have an ice cream maker, <laughs> yeah. uh, a really nice oven to bake bread and, you know, it's a lot of things. We don't have a pastry program, you know, so collaboration spirits is, is huge in our community. Um, not even just for products, but for so much more mm -hmm. for, 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 uh, guest servicing, you know, all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear, um, what the other core values are. Cause I, I think that's, that's so great that you're collaborating with so many different local, artisan kind of, uh, you know, companies producing like really high quality stuff. Cause then it just makes it even easier for you to bring it all together and make something taste amazing because you're using like other people's, uh, products with using, love and care and passion. Exactly. I'm, you know, use the experts, learn from the experts that does their single, you know, own thing, because I, I I'm not going to be great at everything. I'm really not, you know, I'm not a good pastry chef. I mean, if you, if I'm being honest, right. So why not collab and use and give people the opportunities to, you know, provide the service, provide the craft and share the craft. So I think that's pretty cool. It's, it's not to cover up the fact that I can't do it is there's so many other ways to look at it from that point. Cause I don't, I, I'm just not going to be the best at everything. Right. Yeah. I don't think anyone is. Right? Yeah, for sure. I don't think totally. anyone is. Um, so, you know, that's the core values. That's, the other ones are more, um, you know, they are important. They're, um, positivity, right? We, the, so that angle, instead of talking about the negative side, let's talk about the positive side because positivity is what we need in the world right now. Um, positivity doesn't mean that it has to be sugar coated. I think positivity just needs to be real be from a different angle, mm -hmm. right? Cause it still needs to be real cause it's a real issue or whatever yeah. it is. 
just don't you don't need to sugarcoat it. Um, you know that that might be negativity in my opinion, like sugarcoating, because you're gonna get negativity at, on the back end, right? Um, so so positivity is one. Sustainability is one. Fun. Um, we've had a lot. I've had a lot of kitchen where you can't listen to music and just kind of joke around here and there. We want people to have fun, right? Like coming to work, having fun is way more important than than a lot of other things because if they're not having fun at work, it'll feel like work. Yeah. And now it is work and it'll feel like work, but if there's a chance that we make it not feel like work, you know, like more like a little family, a little culture within, then that's cool. I mean, you know, um, honesty, that's, that, that goes hand in hand with positivity. Um, just gotta be honest. Like, you know, if we, we messed up, we'll tell you we messed up and let's see how we can move past this or however it goes. Um, humility is a big one, right? Like we, everything we've gotten or received is, is, is considered a blessing. We're grateful to, to have the opportunities to even do any of this. So being humble is, is very, it's, it's important. Not with just guests or anything like that, to ourselves, to our people. Um, so that, you know, because we're leaders, right? Leaders, um, managers, you know, whichever words that you, you use. Um, we have to be kind of almost perfect <laughs> in a sense for people to, 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 to look up to us yeah. or not. But just to see that we're honest, we're kind, and and we're not maliciously trying to ruin anyone's life or anything like that. Um, wonder is a big one. For, forgiveness is, is, a, is another one, right? Like everyone makes mistakes. But my golden rule is let's make new mistakes. We, 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 there are mistakes that you make every day, and that's fine. But let's try to make new mistakes. Because if you don't make new mistakes, you will not learn new things. In my opinion, like growing microgreens, I'm sure you've learned to make new mistakes or even yeah. old mistakes, but you learn from it every time, right? Like, okay, That's well, this just took seven days out of my life, <laughs> you know, uh, and it didn't come out right. So I got to do it again. You know, those are more humbling experience because it's time consuming mistakes. Yeah. Um, and there's a wonder one. The wonder one is uh, wonder is uh, a, a nice segue to how we take care of our people, right? Wander, we we believe in traveling and seeing the world. You're in Mexico right now. Yeah. That's a cool culture. That's a cool space to be in, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've learned a lot more. Have you been in Mexico before? I have, but I've learned more than I could explain on this trip. Yeah. Exactly. So, every, so, so, Timing too is also important to me. Like, like I went to New York, say four years ago, at a different time, at a different headspace. I didn't learn much, to be honest. Same trip, same mm -hmm. style of eating and all of that. But I did one a month ago, and I've learned a hundred times more than the first time. But that was just one perspective. But so we take one percent of our um, net profit and we put it aside. And so we use that as a traveling stipend for our team. Any, any employee, not just full-time, part-time, we split that yearly back to them. And so we are all, we've already done our last 10 months. So we stopped at December. So then we just start a new year in January. So we're able to give back a good bit to our, our employees. So we got to see someone going to Barcelona, um, I'm sorry, Japan. She's wow. coming back, I think, this week. Right. Um, so, so it's used to buy your air, air, air fees and uh, airfares and uh, hotels. Um, and so she's gone. She gotten back to from Japan. Two more people is going to the Philippines. Uh, someone else is going to Barcelona next week. And we just got to. We want people to travel and get out of this comfort zone that they're in, or not comfort zone. Just get out, right? Yeah. To see the world, because when you see the world, you see different perspective. And that will inspire you to be, I'm not asking you to be different, but you can be better for yourself, better for your, 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 your thinking. Uh, you, you get inspired by eating something that's different from what you're used to. 
mm-hmm. more organic stuff, more local stuff, things that you can't get here, you know, see the different lives. And so that's pretty cool. Um, and, and we do that ourselves too, right? We'll recommend where you want to go, where are you going in Japan? Um, I've, I've gotten a chance of taking that trip a few months ago. So that was pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, just, just a way to give back. Right. So then PTO on top of that. So pay vacations, um, pay birthdays off health benefits, um, copay health benefits. We'll do free mental health online. We'll do gym memberships and taking care of that, sustaining our people. Right. Um, like if you're going on a trip and then you don't have PTO that you really, it's going out of your pocket, which is hard for some paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Stop. Um, and so we're providing pay time off while you go on your vacation and hopefully your airfares and your, um, Airbnbs are paid for. Um, obviously depend on how much work you have put back into the, the, the how many hours you put into the years and that kind of, regulates how many how much money you're able to use yeah it's it's a fair system in 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 the sense time wise you give me more time in at work we give you more time outside of work yeah yeah no that's great like the mutual benefit mutual beneficiality it i think is important in in business and in life it's just like you know it's like when, when when someone when someone gives you a gift you feel like naturally called to want to give something back it's just i feel like it's it there's this uh innate uh you know generosity from receiving and vice versa um right. that that's that's really beautiful but yeah like honestly i think unintentionally you've convinced me that i want to work for noco you know like <laughs> like which is which is really cool like it, i know that wasn't your intention it was just sharing the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mission and, and, and and you know what you're trying to do uh but it, it resonated very strongly with me and i and i'm sure there's lots of other people that do that feel that way as well and that's what i was talking about earlier where like you're pushing forward what it means to work at a restaurant, to own a restaurant. Uh, and I think, I think that's really great because it will attract the best talent um, to, to have at your company, but it'll also inspire others to do the same and, and, and start shifting for the positive um, and some of the bigger challenges that the industry has, has seen, um, which, is, which I think is really, really cool. So like I've been, I've been loving listening to this so far. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but let, maybe let's let's uh, yeah I, let, let's yeah. talk a little bit about I, I love to hear what like a typical week looks like for you as the executive chef and a partner of Noco Nashville. Um, and so to be fairly honest, you know I've used to work in six seven days a week before in other restaurants just because I'm that kind of guy. You know you can call me a workaholic if you like, but I just really enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I think it's peaceful. I think it's it's my space. For me, um, and so uh, uh, we're close every Mondays at NOCO. So you definitely we can you know, sorry about that. You get a, a day off from from service, right? Alone. Uh, it's also a great day for us to kind of like either the end of the week is like okay, I get a day off, or a day to catch back up if it's necessary, right? Like a full day. Um, so my day would be consider Mondays off, right? Um, I would do I would do five days um, for the most part six when whenever there's you know my suits going on vacation and stuff um, so I come in in the morning I I'm on the line all the time I'm opening and closing I'm not I'm not a clipboard guy I, I'll have to do that too but I enjoy being on the line working with the people and, and the, the team um, so I'm pretty much just there early in the morning. Uh, Kind of overseeing everything, receiving, making sure that everyone has what they need, have what they need as far as prep, as far as ingredients, as far as just tools in general, everything, right? And making sure that they're up on, you know, they're not struggling doing what they do. But that means the training, that means tools, that means am I providing the space and the tools for them to be successful, right? That's every day. You, it's never. It's never not a day where I don't do that. Um, And then you work the line, see the service and, you know, take feedback from the service, stuff like that, and finish out closing. I also like to prep at night. It's just me. It's peaceful Um, when no one's there. That's my kind of day. Yeah. Um, I don't expect anyone to do that. That's not a typical 
thing, but it's me. It's what I like to do. Uh, and and there's also a time where I get to play with new ideas and stuff without anyone kind of, you know, um, distracting, right? Because um, that's what you need, the, the space and time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, pretty pretty straightforward, open and close type of guy. I'm on the line almost every day, you know, every time I'm in the building. It's just part of it. On the floor, too, even talking to guests is fun. I enjoy doing that. Uh, meeting regular, saying hello, you know, let them get them to taste something that's coming up on the menu or something like it's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's great. I think, um, having that time alone, like the emptiness of not having anyone in the restaurant really allows the creativity to spark would be my guess. That's what I've kind of seen is the more empty my mind is, the more time I have to think of creative ideas. So, um, on, on that, uh, how does the kind of menu curation process look like at NOCO? Oh, so to, okay, it's fun because I actually, I'm doing it right now, like in the past few weeks because we're changing things, the seasons are coming up. Um, so the original menu, the first menu, right, which is the very opening menu, we, the way I think about food, we thought about food is, It has to be the two ideas, approachable and affordable, right? Um, if it's too expensive, then it's not approachable or affordable. Or, you know, like it's, it's, it's just hard for people to try because they're not, they might not have the means to, and you're not really. So that goes back to the demographics. We want to have something for everyone, right? Um, all types of. Um, of, of, of you know college students high school students um, you know ballers you know we have baller options on the menu however you want to go big parties family style everything but um, the idea is just to be affordable and approachable and the third thing is craveable mm. all right how do we get through all those three things uh, you know there's, there's so many cracks and creases you gotta fill so like um, how do, you know, I, I can create a, a full Vietnamese menu that is unfamiliar with people, but they won't be able to enjoy that as much because they're not familiar with it. So um, we take classic dishes of as many, you know, cuisine and stuff that we know and love by tra from traveling and eating um, and then put a noko twist on it. So the noko twist is Japanese inspired wood fire. Mm. Or, or Asian, and actually, I'm sorry, Asian-inspired wood fire. And um, I'm Vietnamese, so there's a lot of that going in there flavor-wise, right? It's not on the menu. It's just flavor mm. um, influences. Um, so, for example, a burrata, right? That's not, a, that's not an Asian thing. It's cheese. Um, but we took the wood fire, so we smoked the tomatoes, right? And so we have tomatoes, burrata, and then on the pesto, instead of using regular garlic and basil, I would use Thai basil and mm. black garlic. Interesting. Right? So you kind of noco find the, 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 the classic dishes. It still is going to look the same. You still have tomatoes, burrata, and pesto. But the flavors and the way that was prepped is quite Asian-inspired and wood fire. Um, Similar, similar ideas to everything else we put on the menu, right? You take something that is classic, bar, uh, classic Franklin style, Texas style, Southern style barbecue, right? And now um, we use our oak to smoke our, 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 our program. So then I use a Asian um, sushi brine on the wings instead of a regular brine. Hmm. And then use a Japanese um, uh, seasoning on the dry rub. So like right, you taking something that's classic and and perfected in a sense and then add your own twist and then work that around the process. Um, cool. That's the first idea. That's the first menu. Now if like right now if I were to go to a new menu, then I would have to kind of look at how the restaurant performs as a whole in different stations. And if this station doesn't have enough things, let's think about one what's craveable and how do we put something on that station and, and take off other stations to make 
the harmonize the kitchen and the menu rather than just putting whatever you want on there that might make like it, you can make anything but does it fit into our operation and our cuisine our, our menu or our stations right if it's not executable i'm not doing it right at the highest level yeah um, so then one more small thing it's like okay i can create i believe in creating sevens and eight at a hundred percent success rate then nines and tens at a lower rate mm. right? because there are days when you'll come in at a 10 level food restaurant but then the execution is not great but what if you do sevens and eight but you do it so well across the board at all times that makes it reliable um people come for what they you know what they know and love and they rely on it they know it they trust it um and so satisfaction will be way higher than, you know, having a 10, paying for a 10, but executed at a three, right? Um, yeah. Consistency, that's the other word, sustainability and consistency. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's, that, that just like opened my eyes to like a whole new world that I didn't really realize because uh, my farm sold, we, a lot of our product went to restaurants, but it would go through distributors because we got, like my farm got quite large. So that I didn't work d- directly with, with, with chefs as often as a lot of some of the farms like, like Pinky's is doing. Uh, and it, it just, it's just great to hear how intentional and also how complex the process can be because everything needs to fit in. It's like, it's th- this concept I use a lot, which is like the weakest link. If, if, if there's something, let's say it's a great item, it's affordable it's uh, craveable, but it just doesn't fit in to the workflow. As an example, it's, it's not going to work. So all it takes is one thing to be off for it to really mess up the, the system. And it's cool to see that play out in, in restaurants as well, where it's so important to have everything really lined up properly and to be intentional in making that decision, because then you can kind of uh, ensure that it's going to be smooth sailing from right. the day you, you launch that menu. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great because it all, it, one little thing can affect service, can affect one table, can affect one guest. And, I mean, anything could happen at any given time, but to prevent. So also the, the, the other thing I've been kind of thinking about a lot personally is in general is how to, um, you know, narrow that margin of errors, right? Like when you're yeah. say for your business, you know, you want to eventually create a system to where you're not, things are not wrong all the time like the success rate is higher so margin of error is smaller and thinner and that's our goal right like make sevens and eight but if you can execute at 100 percent, why not can uh, you know not to mention the big name um you know fast food restaurants but just like everything else like chick-fil-a or stuff like that is consistency right yeah they're so consistent nike they're consistent you know like apple they're consistent it's really important because people will know what they're paying for yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a great point. And, and in my experience, like whenever I've been to, to restaurants that it's like, sometimes it's really great. And then sometimes it's like bad. I generally don't like, to be honest, I don't go back, you know, and, and, and then <laughs> like, like, so, so it may, it makes sense that, that it, it's better to have, uh, instead of trying to strive for perfection, creating absolute tens across the board on, on dishes, if you can make them that they're still going to be like, like an eight is seven, eight is pretty good on a food scale. You know, most people, are so used to like maybe threes or something uh, just with the standard, yeah. you know. It's uh, just not, I mean, that's subjective on our guests and how they feel about my food and our food. It was just more like an idea, right? Like, yeah, I, no, I, for I, sure. I to create, I'll do a seven and eight. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I think that that's a great segue into um, getting into the like the microine side of things with, with, uh, with NOCO is um, like you mentioned consistency as, as an important uh, factor. So, I, I would love to hear, like, what are the deciding factors in choosing a microgreens grower to work with and purchase from? Because I'm sure you've had, I, I would guess, multiple people approach you, whether it's microgreens or yeah. something else. Uh, and I'm mm-hmm. sure that'll happen even more because, you know, your restaurant is still relatively new. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you that's going to happen more and more as time goes on. So I'd love to kind of hear what those factors are in choosing to work with, with Pinkies versus the other growers that have approached you. Remind me, I have a question for you, uh, either off recording or not recording or however, but a, a fun question. Yeah. Personally. Okay. Um, so how do we decide? Um, well, I mentioned earlier, it's the timing, right? So if you came to me, you know, when I'm in a different process, so right now, let's say opening a restaurant, 
I'm in a process of just deciding the menu items, right? That's a different process. I haven't, I don't have time. I'm just not there yet with the garnishes, right? The, the microgreens, the, the stuff that comes on top later, I'm, I'm at the core. So if you come to me then, and so it'll, it'll, it'll be like, okay, I'll get your card and I'll think about it, right? Um, and then the next follow-up question is like, how do you deliver? How long would it take to grow something? And how consistently is it for you, yet your operation? Um, to deliver the same time or not the same the same day every week right uh, and to some people that's easy so some some that's not um, and how consistent your products that's that's you have to get into it to figure it out if it's consistent or not right like yeah. you have to use it for a few months like okay hey that's not that doesn't taste as good what changes right it doesn't hold as long what changes your containers are different like all of that um, approachability when it comes to how easy it is to handle. The micro, microgreens are delicate, not all, but most, and some because they're small. If you don't have the proper uh, temperature holding area, and you keep, you know, you're not handling it right yourself, it won't last long, and it won't look good, right? Especially micro cilantro, that stuff is sexy, yeah. right? Uh, arugula is a lot, you know sturdier but um and and so there are rest, uh, there are microgreens program that will will you know give you a tray and it's still live and it's still attached to the pad right now that's great and all but i feel like that's really hard to care for because you need the space and the right room spots um to do that so you're right there are a couple of microgreens guy that or, or company has come came in and gave me samples and so there are times when I get the little tray and I have to leave them out in a room temp area, right? And that's not really, it, it's hard. If there's more var variables, there's more chances of messing up and mistakes. So margin of errors, right? For me, that's that. If there's a, when there's a product that is cared for already and packaged properly, that makes it easier for me. It, it's, it's more approachable for, for a restaurant to use. Um, right. And obviously we're not talking about money at all. That's, that's the convenience fee and stuff like that. But we're just talking about the product itself and how convenient it is to use. Um, and so that's one of the factors, right? So package, packaging is huge. One of them. If you come to me and we have to change our tray, you know, every week or every three days, that makes life a little harder because yeah. I'm not an expert at caring for that thing, right? For that stuff. So I won't do it if I'm not an expert or good at it because it just doesn't feel right. And so segue into that question that I had. So, you know, um, or you can answer it in a moment it is how do you deal with chefs or people that works? Well, obviously you, you go through distribution, but if you were to work with local chefs or people around, how do you deal with people that's like, um, not caring for the microgreens properly, obviously education, right? Um, yeah. But also misuse on how they use it on their menu. You know what I mean? Like that's a whole nother. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of, uh, it's actually, it's actually uh, very coincidental that you mentioned about the living product. So I started solely with living product because I was lazy. I wanted to put the work on the people I'm selling it to. So, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the business didn't do that well the first few years because of that. And it was when I switched to cut product that like my business like started to boom. Um, so uh, I made that switch in, in a way out of, out of necessity because I wanted to grow the business. Um, but what I was doing is providing more value for, for chefs, for end consumers, because like the whole, the, it's living, it's fresher, you know, what, like, it may it may sell someone once, but it's 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 not you won't get as many repeat purchases because they got to store it somewhere, and then you never know. Like someone could walk by and like cough on it or something. Like it's 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 not as sanitary. It doesn't. Uh, it then it starts growing, so it doesn't look as good. It can start turning more yellow. Like there's so many factors at play that like it's 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 almost like a, like like false marketing where it's like it's fresher. It's like yeah, it's still alive, but it's like in the process of dying anyway. Um, so yeah. And then in terms of education, um, 
generally like on on the restaurant like on the food service side most of the places like the distributors we sold to the chefs already had microgreens in their menu so it was really we had a better product so the distributors want to carry our product so what there wasn't a, a a big educational learning curve and you know i i i live in toronto it's a big city so microgreens have been around for many years there um so there's already you know somewhat of an established market it's way bigger now like microgreens have really taken off um right. since i started i was actually interestingly i was looking on google trends um and i saw what the 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 uh, so it was from a 0 to 100 when i started in october 2013 the the interest in microgreens in general worldwide was 6 out of 100 and now it's uh on the low season so the like cuz it, it just the time of year on the low season yeah, it's yeah. about 48 and peak season it's about 70 to 80 out That's of 100 wild. yeah so yeah, it's crazy how much has changed since I started. So there's way more demand. Why I have this podcast, why there's so many farms starting out and why I wanted to provide this information on your expertise as, you know, you know, someone, uh, an industry expert in on the culinary side. Now you may not feel that way, but that that's, that's what I think based on the, the conversation we've had so far for sure. Gotcha. Well, thank yeah. you. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, so we talked about kind of the, the, the service and the quality of the product. How does like price play in for, for you in particular? Now, this is going to vary with every chef. It's going to be different depending on the type of restaurant, of course. But just in general, in your experience, how does price kind of play in to... Agreed. Um, so, so to me, in some, in some cases, right, if, you, if you're just using microgreens carelessly, you're really just looking for colors on a plate, right? Colors and contrast on a plate. But if you use it right, it adds the flavor because microgreens are sometimes more punching than the actual larger leaves itself. Like, so um, I, I'm not gonna force, I don't like to force anything just to be cool and waste money on it, right? Like, because it's also about the care that you, you know, growers, right? Do, it's like, don't, you know, I'm not gonna use something that is out of my cuisine. So I'll give you some example, we use arugula, here and there for our, uh, you know, burrata set. And I thought that's very cool. We use our cilantro for our uh, hamachi crudo set, right? And then we use our dill for our fish set because we use regular dill or micro dill into the mix. So it makes sense to have something green on top. So it's dual purpose, right? You have a little bit of color, a little bit of garnish, but it's also, it's intentional because it makes sense to the flavor. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, and, and my background is putting is sushi. I've been doing sushi for ten years. Sneak peek, we're opening another restaurant soon. Um, sushi. Awesome. Um, so, so then that will will get me into with with Jacob about growing wasabi. Mm -hmm. Right. So Japanese cuisine, micro wasabi is delicious. Um, and so things like that. So, so right now it's it's just going using things intentionally, right? And once you do that it makes sense to justify with the cost. If you're using, say, corn shoots just for garnish something that doesn't have corn or anything at all, right? It's difficult to grow, I think. It's also changed color quickly if you don't keep it up right. Yeah. Right. It, it changes, you know, colors. And then it's pointless. In some, not all sense, and I'm, I'm just speaking on the fact that if you use it wrong just for color and garnish, Right, so now that makes it expensive for no reason. Mm. And then you can't justify that and it doesn't make sense. Now, because our menus are value, very, you know, we budget and we make it value, value. We don't need unnecessary things on the plate that will cost us or the guests anything more than it needs to, to support our affordability and approachability. Now it doesn't look like a blob of mess, right? No, not at all, but it just needs to be intentional. Uh, price point wise, because if you use it intentionally and you use it right, a, a, a four ounce pack can go a long way, right? If you properly care for it, easy packaging, you know, things like that, that keeps longer um, and you use it right, it will last a while, right? Like it's good. You can stretch it out. Not to be cheap. Not, I don't mean that because sometimes you don't want to just throw a whole. Yeah. Right. Like you have to use it intentionally and make it look good. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I don't think as far as price point on micros is not. It's not 
it shouldn't it shouldn't it shouldn't even affect the business if you use it properly in my opinion okay uh, you don't need microgreens on everything i feel like I think yeah cold food is the best to me right so room temperature food like our crudo right um because it won't wilt by the time it gets to the table mm -hmm. right it depend on the microgreens obviously um dill is also delicate when it comes to heat yeah yeah. So then I put down on our uh, fish dip, which is a cold dish, right? And then the pesto and the burratas are cold, so the, 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 the arugula will also sit on there just as great. Um, and then you got to think about, because it's not a product that you go in-house. You guys do, you guys take care of that, or the, the grower takes care of that. So you want to showcase the product in the best state that it can be. And so the care for it, the, the, the leaving it on top as a garnish and do it intentionally, it's, it's also important to me. Um, yeah. You obviously don't use that for pesto because that just kind of ruins the, the point of microgreens to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, can, I have, but I have, I have unlimited microgreens. So right, right, I always right, make right. Uh, pesto. Exactly. But yeah, like, like it would be very expensive for someone to, to make pesto for micro basil for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, but just but that's the idea. If you use it right, right. I mean, I don't think the price um, is is anything. And now I could only. I mean, that's a whole nother question for you as a business person. Is like, what's your margin? You know, like we don't. You don't have to answer that question. But what would be the margin for a business like that? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a lot of waste? Um, um, obviously, you need space, compact, efficient space to do to 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 make the business bigger, right? But it, it's you know, is it is it something that people are leaning towards because it's more the margin is higher now than before because of the volume or because the price has gone up? Yeah, you know? yeah, no, for sure. I, I think generally speaking, as farms get bigger, their margins generally get lower, uh, at least what I've seen, because a lot of migrants farms start off, they're just doing it on their own. They're not really accounting for their labor and they're doing it from like their house so they don't have rent. And then as they, you know, as, as, as Pinkies has been expanding, as I'm sure you've, you've uh, witnessed, they, there's more costs that kind of uh, accumulate. Um, but you get to a point where like, you know, having, you have more volume so you can make more and like total dollar revenue and, and, and profit, but the margins start shrinking as you, as you generally scale these type of businesses is, is what I've seen. But, but uh, I was curious on, on how, like, from your experience of using something like cilantro, how many dishes would you say that a uh, four ounce clamshell can can serve, roughly? Oh, that, if you like were super to compare, rough. sure, super like for example, one four ounce pack can I can honestly get probably a hundred portions for what i use mm -hmm. right now if you have a larger carpaccio like say you go to nobu new york their carpaccio is a giant right and they're at 40 something 50 dollars a piece which means they'll use more if that's what they use yeah because our plate is around the night the late teens the higher teens it's not it doesn't require that much right you don't want to cover the fish with it yeah um, yeah right but but i would I, I can stretch it pretty far for that dish alone so I'll give you uh, give a nag example, right? Like if a four ounce is what twenty bucks, rough, give or take, twenty bucks, twenty five bucks, I can stretch that to uh, maybe eighty to a hundred plates, right? For garnish, purpose, intentionally garnish yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and so that's really not a lot. You add another twenty five cents to a plate, right? Something like that. Just give an example. Yeah. So it's not really that sus substantial to mess up the cost of your restaurant or anything like that. as long as you use it intentionally i keep saying that yeah um, no i think i think that's 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 an important point uh because i think i think it's important from the the grower side uh because then they can they can really like like focus on not just like that this is a garnish for your restaurant but like what flavor will this provide based on the dishes you have so the, I, I had a, a guest on greens bali who uh told me about they made this like flavor wheel 
out of microgreens to bring to restaurants as like a, so it's like, he, these are all the different colors. These are all different flavors. And then there's like a, a you know, a, a, a sample wheel where you can be like, okay, this is, these are the spicy section. This is the colorful section. This is the, uh, you know, herb section or, or, you know, and, and so, so you can really, um, and they've done really well in terms of getting a lot of restaurants from that. And I think you kind of, uh, uh, reemphasize that point that it's not just for garnish for restaurants. It's also adds flavor. So I think it's important for, for growers to recognize that there's two components there that, that are important. And, and, and also it's great to see that even though your dishes are very affordable, you know, that you're still able to incorporate microgreens in, because generally speaking in the industry as a whole, it's more fine dining, high-end restaurants that will use it because that's generally who can afford it. But if you're using it like not, not in a, not in like crazy amounts that ends right. up being relatively affordable to add to dishes, which also from a, uh, you know, the sales size perspective is like, you can go to a restaurant and be like, Hey, this clamshell that costs you $20, what can serve potentially a hundred, uh, like let's say a hundred dishes. And then you have the, the, the numbers to kind of help back, um, your sales pitch showing that it's mm -hmm. not going to be unaffordable for them. Uh, cause they may right. not do the, the mental math right there. And then when you're doing the sale, but if you do it for them, you help make the decision easier for them to at least try to use it on their dish. And like something like micro cilantro, like well, I, I can't go back for me personally to regular cilantro because it's just so much richer and the flavor is so yeah. much better that I think if you can convince more people to try it, uh, it's, it's it, funny. It, it is hard you to go back. That. It's funny you said that because you're in Mexico, right? Yeah. Like, so just think about the rusticness, depend on the type of cooking. If you go, depend on the rusticness of the cooking, they will not even know and touch micro cilantro ever because they love their own cilantro, right? Like the Hispanic. It's not the same though. <laughs> it's not, I agree. I definitely agree. It's not the same at all. It's just the application. So mm. breaking that traditional barrier is also a little difficult because in, in my cuisine it's the same. Like you have my parents or my, my family, they're so, traditional that they just know what they love and when you're trying to change that perspective it's hard but you have to start slowly mm. and so some people might eat micro cilantro and say i don't know just what, what is this right but if you actually just eat it by itself you can actually taste more of it and and, and see how how good it is it's just like you said it's hard because a lot of time they use cilantro in sauces Right, mm -hmm. but how much micro cilantro do you yeah. have to use? Right, it's 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 texture too. It's also that, that that stem and a lot of things, different different process, different application. Um, For sure. And all that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I think that there's there's some really really good advice there for for that like takeaways for, for farms that are trying to uh, sell to to restaurants or or chefs. Um, so I, I I would love to hear like what kind of like what the interaction with Pinky Micros kind of look like and how they're able to get you to be a customer. I think it's an it's, important to understand that. Not every story has to be like great, I don't think, right? But this one is, I think, he came in to eat before I think we start using his, you know, or, or, no, I, he came in and, 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 and I think simultaneously I started using his products and then he got to come in and eat and experience because I think now, not that anyone has to, but I think it's important for our people that we work with to enjoy and to experience the food and the, the, the hospitality that we provide, right? So so they can see and understand the intentions of why I'm doing what I'm doing and how I do it. Now, you know, I can use someone's product, but we can both misrepresent each other at any given point, right? Mm -hmm. Without the intentions of it. And so he sent us samples and he's always been punctual, like on time, reliable. That's a small thing, but it, it, it's important because yeah. if we agree that you're going to bring me this, let's bring me this. And then um, I think from both sides, he makes it very, very easy and convenient to like set up payments, right? Like that sometimes is also a big problem. A lot of people might think that people, you know, so they drop and they drop and they drop the product and they drop an invoice and they leave a lot of times. Um, well, while, while I'm, if, he, if I'm there, I'll have a conversation, but if I'm not, then, you know, he just drops and go. And there are times where a restaurant will not pay on time in a sense, 
mm-hmm. and that makes it very difficult for small businesses, right? And so yeah. relationship is huge. Like if you drop the invoice, I put it in ACH, your money goes in by like the seventh day or whatever. And that allows you to keep your phone and your business going. And I think that's also important. And he might have posted something about that on Instagram here and there about not anyone specific, but specific, but in general, right? Yeah. That's huge. Communication, relationship. Um, and he would have to eat the products that we're using on the application that we're, 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 we're using it on so that he can continue to understand what we need. Like understanding each other is huge. Like don't come, you don't have to come to me and offer me something like say um, a, a random micro that you are growing, but it doesn't fit for me at all. Like understanding is huge. Like you don't go to, um, let me just think of one. Um, like purveyors that doesn't have anything to do with our kind of food, right? Yeah. That makes it very difficult. Like uh, you're a steakhouse, you know, and you have a seafood guy that comes in and trying to sell you stuff that's not a norm. Like it doesn't make yeah. sense. You know what I mean? yeah, it might yeah, not be the sure. greatest example, but it just doesn't make sense. Like like you don't sell me things I don't need. Like that's that's the first thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's one of it. Um, and it, it has been pretty cool because it's also Nashville is a smaller community. So we see Pinky's Micro everywhere. He also has an open market in the flea market every Sunday, Saturday. Mm-hmm. So it, it works really well for people to just pick up, right? Easy packaging. People yeah. can come in and pick up a pack and go home and use it without having to take care of it. Like so intently. Um, um, and, and I think so. I think I think easy communication, right? Um, payment. Obviously, you have to take care of them for them to take care of you, in a sense. And just communication. He's and he's also not forceful. He likes to if he knows that he there's something um, new. He would like, hey, Junior, try the sample of the red Rubens. Try some of the tie bays or something, something, right? But he's not forceful. I mm-hmm. think it's also important. Because if I need it, I'll get it. I don't, you know, you don't need to push me and to ordering something. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. if I need it, I definitely gonna call you. And so, yeah, consistency, and, and, and it's great. He hasn't missed anything yet, or I haven't. I hope I haven't missed any payment. <laughs> yeah. No. For, I, I think you brought up some some really good points. I think one one is trust, which is uh, I think so important in business as in personal relationships is like, you know, if you're, you're, you're almost like, you know, in a way he he's bringing, he, you're trusting him that he's going to bring it every week. He's trusting you that you're, you're going to pay on time. And then like, if, if one side starts, you know, you make a mistake once, like you said, you learn from it. Right. But if you continuously pay late or continuously deliver late, you're damaging the relationship. And then you're, you're, you know, potentially going to lose a customer because like no one wants to make, no, like people are busy, you're busy, Jacob's busy. And like, you just want things to, to run smoothly uh, and to make it easy for you to work with people. And then the, the other point is like understanding the customer. So, right, right. It, you know, if, if you're, yeah. if you're, if you don't understand the customer, if you're like, let's say, I think, I think a big one for a lot of new growers is like, you know, I teach a, a course on, on growing and selling microgreens and it's the beginner friendly varieties. And most of them, like pea shoots, radish, they can work in restaurant situations and specific situations. But it's really this course is geared towards like delivering to end consumers that are going to consume it as like a salad or for health purposes. Um, right. But when you when you get into selling to restaurants, you have to really understand the customer and know that like, hey, they're like they're probably not going to use broccoli microgreens as as great as they are from a health perspective. Like it's yeah. just very unlikely. I've personally never seen a restaurant use it unless it's like a health food restaurant. They're using it in the same way that end consumer. Whereas in my experience, like basil, cilantro, amaranth, uh, beets, like these are ones that are red vein sorrel that are much more common in restaurants. So if you bring in the right products, like it, it sends a different message to the chef than if you're like bringing in stuff that like they're not going to use. You're like you, you're, you're setting yourself up for um, for a higher chance of failure, uh, which, which in the beginning is not necessarily a bad thing. Cause then you learn, okay, chefs don't really want broccoli. They want cilantro and, 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 uh, 
um, wasabi and things depend if it's if it's like you know Japanese style restaurant. So I, I think it just it's helpful to understand your customer. I think that's a really good point, um, and not just kind of going in blindly to restaurants and assuming they're all the same. But there is unique uh, differences between different types of restaurants depending on the cuisine. And to if you're going to bring samples, bring what you know is more aligned with what would actually fit. And it isn't just about microgreens. It's literally everything. Yeah. Right? There's purveyors that will come into the restaurant, and, and and this is more just side notes, just for, for for something from a perspective of mine. You know, there there are people who are competitive in, in in their nature, and they will come in and kind of start talking about other places, right? Other micro yeah. or other businesses. You don't have to do that. If you provide, I feel like if you provide the 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 the, the service that is best for that restaurant in your own way and most most fitting, then they'll they'll hop over and they'll do what you do or, or, or they need you to do. There's no need to kind of like um, bad mouthing anyone else or 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 uh, blindly say I'm better than the others. Right. Yeah. You don't need to blindly say that because you don't know if you're better. You really don't. Right. Because, you know, when it comes to like microgreens, I'll give let's let's be let's be uh, and, and this is my perspective only, right? Um, like, say there are 10 micro green growers that grows all micro cilantro. What makes one better than the other? Can a normal person's palate tell the difference between one or the other? Or can it, they de not? it depends. So, right. um, you know, as an example, I, I did uh, one of my like marketing tactics is, is I, I knew because I like I, I have a good sense of what is a good micro green after doing it for so long. So right, I right, actually right. did a nutrient analysis comparing our product to uh, another local organic grower. And right. it was like, it was insane. The difference it was between um, on the low end was protein was 40% higher. And on the high end um, iron was three uh, X. So you just uh, open up a new perspective for me now. Yeah. Because on the outside, it looks the same. Right? Yeah. No, What's for the sure. Difference between, right. And so now it, it's more, it's different how it was grown and what soil and all this stuff. Yeah. Right. So yeah. now it's getting even deeper, <laughs> you know, like what makes one better than the other? Not the, not the way it looks, but the underneath the one before, like how they grow their beef, cattle, land, mm -hmm. you know, so that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so food, I, I feel like food has like just society in general has, has, has treated it more like a commodity over time, just because of the way our, you know, economic system kind of works. Um, but what I've, what I've noticed is like, you know, I, I, this, this is what kind of got me started in farming was I tried a real cherry tomato for the first time that was grown on a vine in my parents' garden or my dad's garden. And I was like, whoa, like this, this is a <laughs> tomato. Like I'm so used to like the cardboard, like no flavor, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and so, so I realized like there is a massive difference between how it's grown, um, how it's cared for. And, um, and I, I think that, that that's from my perspective, one of the selling points that I, I encourage people um, is right. to like, okay. you know, f figure out how to grow the highest quality product or make the highest quality product because with food in particular, that's what's going to get people to rebuy it rather than right. like, you know, if you have the, 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 you know, if you're competing on price, that's one thing. But if you're, if you're competing on, on quality and you're giving something that's subpar and it costs you an extra like 15 cents per $20 item, like an example with microgreens to get the quality to be a lot higher, it's like, you, I, it, yeah, right. to me, it just makes sense. So um, that, that's my perspective, but it doesn't mean it's the only perspective or the right perspective. It's just what I've experienced sure. specifically with vegetables, I would say, microgreens included and, and fruit, things like that, that are mm. that are grown and you can really make a big difference in, in in the soil and thus how the plant tastes. And and you can taste the nutrients in plants, um, which is really cool. Fruit's a big one because usually the more nutrient yeah, dense yeah, the fruit, fruit is, sure. yeah. the, more, the more sugar generally it'll have. And so it'll have more complex flavor, more sugar um, in fruit. So it's a little easier with fruit, but something like cilantro, I could, if I, if I taste uh, another grower's cilantro and they're not using fertilizer, I could tell you right away because yeah. it would be more bitter and less, yeah. less, of, yeah. yeah, less of that specific cilantro flavor that people are looking for. I grew up in Vietnam and so it's more tropical country. So that's more the fruit, unbeatable. Like, yeah. Unbeatable. So yeah so flavor i mean it's, it's it's all subjective but it's all there's facts and stuff like that too um you know like like carrots is another fun one right mm -hmm. like carrots are like cardboards now like there's no 
I mean, that's roughly any good carrots anymore. Yeah. Um, and and if you do find it, it's very expensive. And if you do find it, you kind you kind of you kind of want to use it in an application that showcase the carrots, not braise and mask up in flavors, right? Because then that ruins the purpose of the the heirloom carrots or whatever you know people might call it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's it's, it's a great point. It kind of opens my brain up for like, okay, well, yes, food is food, but there's more to it than that. And now that's funny because the next time someone asks me something, I'm like, what's the nutritional values on those? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It, you could taste funny. it though, which is cool. Yeah. So like, like our 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 our, our palate. Uh, was yeah. designed to seek out nutrients, right? So we seek out calories, yeah. which is why we crave sugar and fats and and uh, and protein a lot of time. But then we also crave the 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 micro, like the nutrients, the iron, the and you could yeah. you, it, it's it's kind of crazy. Like it, it's it's very subtle. It's not something that you're like uh, unless unless it's grown really well and something's grown really poorly. For example, if you taste the lettuce that's grown in like a a very harsh environment, it'll often be bitter. And then a lettuce that's grown in a more ideal environment will will be very light. It'll it'll have a very different flavor. Um, mm. And this happens with arugula, with with so many different things. It, the, the the flavor is different. And I've I've noticed this. I've done growing experiments. Um, I have on, on on the YouTube channel that I have um, comparing like growing with fertilizer and without fertilizer because most mm. people say, oh, you don't need fertilizer for microgreens, but you can taste it's 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 much sharper. Like it's it's a less pleasant flavor when you when you grow it without fertilizer because the plants are getting stressed out so just like we get stressed out and you know illness or uh, you know yeah right, right. It's, it's the same kind of concept which is which is uh really cool but uh, this very is where i could talk about forever these type of things very interesting concept right yeah. so i mean i've always said if you're not good then you can't be good for anybody mm. like yourself right? I agree. so it's yeah. similar idea there like if yeah. you know like the product is you and if you're not taking care of you and be good, you really can't be good for anybody. It's mm -hmm. it's simple, but it's difficult to do. I would say. Yeah, um, no, uh, I, I totally agree. I think it's uh, it's important life philosophy to to bring to continue to evolve and, and grow and and be the I, the best human being that you, that you that you can be for for yourself, but also for those around you. I love this. I love these conversations because it's you doing the same thing I'm doing, but in a different format, <laughs> which is growing greens right it's yeah the passion the care and the love and the dedication right all of that it's easy to say but you know how do you relate from one to another um sustainable business requires sustainable people and every it all just need to go sideways right like sustainability across the board mm -hmm. in order to get the most product um and and what we think about it is like a lot of people would think about you know do i want a million dollar now or do i want 250 dollars thousand dollars for four years which one do you want right mm -hmm. and that's the question uh, of, of sustainability is like i don't want i i want to be here for a long time i want to be doing this for a long time i don't need a million dollars today and then i use it all easy comes easy goes right you yeah. use it all today i'd rather that it sustainably comes to me because the structure is stronger so it will take a lot harder for you to lose that structure yeah. Like building, same thing, right? If it's grow too fast, like GMO, like chickens, the chicken's not going to be good. But if there's enough time for the chicken to free range, it'll it'll, it'll have more nutritional values, right? So it's a, it's a concept that you can use across anything, and it's pretty mm -hmm. cool to be able yeah. to see the passion and the dedication in a awesome. different field. Man. Yeah, no, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Like, like I sense that, and I've noticed this sometimes when I have conversations. Um, like I had a conversation with another microgreens educator where uh, we're doing the same thing and we're like, we can, we have the same energy that we're bringing to, uh, you know, to business as an example. And it's cool to see in a completely different industry with, with you, uh, how we, we have the same passion, the same, the same drive, the same mindset on, on business and life. Um, and we're just, we took two completely different paths, but it, it's cool to like connect with you and, and be able to see. Um, someone with the same mindset, doing something very different, having the, you know, similar kind of, you know, success from what I can see, just like, you know, making mistakes and learning from them. Like, that's what I consider success, not, you know, financial or whatever, things like that. So like you have the same mindset right. and I think right. mindset it's is the journey. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the journey is, is definitely, uh, you know, if you enjoy the journey, then it doesn't matter where you end up because you enjoy the whole, the whole journey. Right. 
right? Yeah, it's got, exactly. And that's what part of traveling, right? Traveling is about going here and going home. Traveling is actually about the middle part, the the hotels, the walking, the eating, the seeing people, the meeting people. Because yeah. the destination that's a good way to put it because the destination is just to go back home. I don't want that, right? Like I want to enjoy the 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 middle of it. And so yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. No, this is this has been great. Uh, one last question before we we wrap up, uh, which I ask everyone, and I'd love to hear what what uh, what your take on this. If you can go back in time when you start your business, or if you want to think back to when you start getting into you know the culinary scene, whichever works better for you, and meet that younger version of yourself, what advice would you give him to set him up for success? <laughs> This is this is very controversial, I guess, because it's like, uh, you know, time traveling is, is one thing, but we're talking about a different <laughs> it's kind of set up right now. Right. I, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Right. Honestly, if you were to ask me if I do it to do it again, I wouldn't change a thing. But if I was to do, I, I would I would save I, I would say tell that person to to save money. So, or, or, or in a sense is time, but not, you know, time is money, money is time in different settings. I think save money by using your time more wisely. It's not the money that you have, cause you might not have any money at all, but use your time wisely uh, to travel, to go out, to see things, to experience things and stuff like that. And that will save you money in a sense because then you don't have to do it later on in life mm. you know what i mean like it's, it's a perspective that i have because now i feel like now it would cost so much more to travel than it would have been if i had back then because back then i had the time to travel now i don't yeah. have the time because mm -hmm. we're a business owner now you know what i mean like so that in a sense that's that's the money right like that's the resource um, yeah, in my opinion. So to so spend your time more wisely to travel because your time back then isn't as valuable as it is now. Um, you know, because because right now you're picking, choosing your friends and your family. Back then you didn't or at least I didn't. I just hung out and whatever, doing all the things that felt like I want to do. But now I, you know, and this is not to get to a sad segue or anything, but time is so valuable because you need to spend it on the business, but, but it's harder to spend time with family now than ever before because we grow apart, right? Not yeah. connection wise. We just grow apart because everyone needs their own family, uh, husband, wives, kids. So that's my only, that's, that's my thing. I was like, use your time back then wisely to yeah. do the things that you're trying to do now <laughs> is to travel and, and just, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I, I feel I, I felt this for I feel it stronger and stronger as time goes on where like, I, I'm, it, it's so important for me to be intentional about what I'm spending my time on because I, 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 I literally feel the the one limited resource we all have, which is time. Uh, uh, right. Slowly, you know, as I get older, and you know, see myself age and, and see the wisdom that comes with that, but also the less time I have to live my life how much how much more precious it becomes each day each week each year uh to to use it wisely so um yeah and and i, I feel that's just an awareness that that i have that you know maybe not everyone has but um yeah time is way for me way more important than than money at this point um just because like you know there's there's literally nothing you can do uh except for take care of your body for the most part but it's inevitable like we all it's something we all share or, yeah, I didn't think this uh, this podcast would, would get so uh, philosophical, but you know it, the truth is we're we're all it, it, it's, yeah. it's it's it, I didn't want all, it to be, but, you yeah. know, but it came out that way just because it, it's a flow, right? It's natural, and we feel that way. And, and like right now, I, I I feel like this conversation and this kind of time is important to share because mm -hmm. it, it might not get to you, but it'll get to someone, right? So my my team. Uh, one of the team member asked me, should I go to Barcelona? And I was like, go, you have the means right now. You have the time right now, do it. Do it before you don't have time, right? As simple mm -hmm. as that. So that's how I, you know, that, there's a regret in life that, 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 not a regret, but 
something we could have done better. So instead of doing it to, you know, why do why wait till tomorrow, right? It's the same, same, same line. Why yeah. wait till tomorrow? You can do it today or start it today. Mm-hmm. Something. Um, so yeah, like my, I, I tell my friends, I was like, anytime anyone kind of just waste my time nowadays, I'm just like, yeah, not again. Like, yeah. Not yeah. again. Yeah. Like, I, I don't have time for for, for, for I, that. I I understand where you're coming from. Uh, I feel that's just something that, uh, yeah. As 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 I get older, and, and it sounds like you as well, like you, it's just so valuable that you want to be doing the things you love, and uh, and you don't have time to to yeah to waste, you know. So yeah, I, th- I think this was great. I think there's there's so much value in this episode. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, if if listeners want to connect with you more or learn more about uh, your business, where can they find you online and on social media? Um, we um, on NoCoNashville.com is our website. Uh, we also have an Instagram page, also NoCo Nashville. Uh, my personal page is called Daddy Fat Snacks <laughs> on Instagram, but it's a link to our our NoCo page. Uh, just because I'm I'm the snack guy, it's like anyone's hungry, I got you. I'm full of snacks. Um, <laughs> awesome. Thank you so. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, you, can, you can find us on noconashville.com and they'll have a link to everything. And you can email us, ask us a question, leave a comment, and we're open to any of that stuff. And I would love to, I mean, maybe this is only one episode, but I feel like we can share a lot more on it at another time and another um, uh, topic. For sure. Yeah, I feel like I, I feel like I'm more and more called to start some sort of like philosophy or like <laughs> life related uh, yeah. podcast, the more I've been doing podcasting, because it seems to just <laughs> naturally flow that way. And maybe that's just where I'm at in life sort of thing. But um, it's been great to have you on. So thanks so much for coming on, Junior. Appreciate your time so much. Appreciate you having me on. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Higgins Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Mike Higgins business, visit MikeHigginsConsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Mike Higgins businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Mike Greens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Mike Green's magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.